Are you ready? America, your final countdown has begun. The old structures are falling. The foundations are being shaken. And there's no one to help you repair the breaches. The destroyers are in your land. Coast to coast, they work their destruction, moving freely, avoiding detection, and striking as they are commanded. Did I not forewarn you? Did not my prophets say so? You've ignored their warnings and you rejected my pleas. Now destruction is your neighbor and she refuses to leave. What is the remedy? What is the cure? The process of reprieve repentance turning away and turning back there is an open door but few will find it the road to redemption is very clear to see but her streets are narrow darkness is here gross darkness is ascending even so i am the light of the world and in me no man shall stumble and lose his way father god thank you for this opportunity to preach today and most of all, to lift up the name of Jesus, that all men will be drawn unto him and be born again. I thank you for unction. I thank you for anointing. I thank you for the power of your spirit to rest upon not only me as a speaker today, but upon the hearers, that they would be doers of the word. Bless everyone that listens today, and may they run with truth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Powerful word indeed. No surprise to the conditions that we are facing today in our world. As I was concentrating and praying and meditating and asking the Lord what he wanted me to preach, and by the way, that is what I do all the time before I stand up before you, is to know what God's heart is and what his will is concerning the messages to the house of God and to whoever the body of Christ that will be listening today. I am not the only voice, I am just an echo of other voices, and I'm a part of the total mosaic picture, if you will, of God that he has. And I understand that, and I recognize, and I realize that, and my assignment is very clear today. And as I was speaking to the Lord about this day, he spoke to these words to me, and he said, decimation, decimation, and that is the title of this message today, decimation. If you're not familiar with decimation, it is a Latin word that comes from decim, which means tenth, a tenth. And it actually comes from the time of the Roman Empire, that the Roman Empire, during the times of sedition and treason, and for uprisings of not only soldiers, but also of citizens and slaves, they would kill one-tenth of the particular uprising to prove publicly they weren't playing. Read it. It's history. It's the truth. And therefore, it brought fear throughout the remaining nine-tenths, if you will, of those that were standing watching the execution. That's where the word came from. And then over time, it lost that particular meaning of tenth, and it became a understanding of destruction and destroying that's why we say the place was decimated. Are you familiar with that? So decimation is the process of destruction. I'm not feeling it today. Let me, let me try this one more time. I need a little bit of an amen somewhere. It is the process of destruction, decimation. And what you're facing today and seeing upon the face of the earth is the process of destruction, you're seeing the process of judgment. Now, I won't be the most popular guy on the block today, and I didn't set out to be, but I'm here to tell you what this nation is facing is God dealing with humanity and dealing with the sin of a nation and the sin of a people, and he is bringing about his decimation process in order to bring the manifestation of what he wants done. It's just that simple. But we don't view it that way in the lens of American Christianity because we don't understand the prophetic, number one, and greater than that, we don't understand God himself. And therefore, because we have been polluted by this propaganda of 
cheap grace. We believe that things that happen in life and things that happen in the nation are accidental, and it's just a part of Mother Nature, it's just a part of society, or it's a part of politics, or it's a part of the atmosphere, or Mother Nature. Is anybody here? These mindsets are mantras that are in the mind of the American people because the preachers and the prophets have not prophesied and declared and taught truth of who God really is. He is an almighty, massively awesome God. He's an incredible God. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of justice, but he's also a God of judgment. He's a God of righteousness. He's a God of holiness. He's all than all than all will ever be. He's perfect in his ways. He's, his, his mind is perfectly in tune with man. He, he knows what he's doing. And we're in the process of decimation. And as I was meditating and praying, I said, Lord, all of these things that are happening, I understand the prophetic and what I see in the word and what I've been told to prophesy over the years. I, I see these things happening. I recognize and I realize the connection to these things. But, Lord, these things are absolutely severe. And as you begin to share this with me, he began, he began to speak to my heart, and he says, these are body blows. I said, body blows, and and body blows, I understand that when you're a a boxer, when you're a fighter, it's not always the hits to the head that take the guy out. It's the body blows. It's the constant body blows, hitting them and, 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 and striking them, blow after blow. That wears out your opponent. Somebody here today, you don't always get the knockout punch. Sometimes you got to do some body blows. And I said, Lord, my God, I said, I see that. It doesn't take somebody who's prophetic and a prophet to see it, but it does take somebody with faith to recognize and realize and be realist with God and say, I understand what's happening. We're having body blows to our country. And isn't it funny or unique, if you will, that's happening in the midsection? Come on now, not only coast to coast, but in the midsection. And it was, I, 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 I said, okay, Lord, that, that's very interesting. I can see that. I can, I, can, I can recognize that. And before I came into the, to the service today, I read an article. It says that the United States right now is a leading country in nat- natural catastrophic disasters. It literally said that America is the earth body bag. Read it. And I was like, yeah, hey, Lord. Is anybody here? I said, it's the earth's body bag, punching bag, if you will. We ended up in a body bag, that's for sure. And so this message today is not something that I just thought of to be mean and wake up and say, well, I'll just tell them how, you know, how I feel about it. This is what the Lord said. Go to Jeremiah chapter 11, if you will. Jeremiah chapter 11, I said all that just to, you know, let you know this is not something I'm thinking of, that I'm not that cruel, mean preacher over there, <laughs> over there. As people listen to you, they, they say, yeah, he's over there. Go there, Jeremiah chapter 11. So we are the earth punching bag, if you will, but we're in the process of decimation. We're in the process of judgment. Are you there? Let's begin in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. I want you to notice this. There is a word. I said there is a word for the hour. There is a word from God. There's a word from his prophets. There's a word from his watchmen. There is a word. There is a word, and the word matches the hour. If you have somebody that's preaching to you cotton candy flowery messages, they don't have the word. Listen to me now. I know there's all kinds of ministries and assignments where you talk about faith and you preach about prosperity and healing and these different things, but if that's all you ever do... If you never warn anybody, if you never tell them about who God really is, if you don't speak to the people of what's happening in the nation, if you don't warn people, then I don't believe you have a word from God. 
I said, I don't believe you have a true word from God. Now, you can mix the word with the teachings of truth, of course, but you cannot exclude prophecy. You cannot exclude warning. I can preach to you about faith, but I could also include prophecy in it because I can't have faith without understanding the times I'm living in. I've got to understand the times I'm living in in order to have faith for the times I'm living in. Is anybody here today? And so you can't exclude the warnings of God, especially while Rome is burning. And we need a word. And so Jeremiah received the word from who? The Lord. Thank God he didn't get it from the denominational headquarters. Hear ye the words of this covenant. Watch this now. Pay attention to me closely. Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, watch this. Jeremiah was told to speak the words that God had given him to those within the Jerusalem and within the nation of Israel. I want you to speak to them specifically. Now, let me show you how ironic this was. This was in a time of a quasi-reformation of Josiah. It was actually during a time of false revival. It was superficial. Read your history. So at the time, it didn't seem right for Jeremiah to be preaching and prophesying warning because everybody and everything seemed to be okay. In other words, just because we have sprinklings of outpourings and moves of God here and there, that does not exclude a nation from the outpouring of the process of decimation. In other words, judgment is set forth, and it does not cause denial nor delay of what God has planned. I'll prove it to you later in the message. And so it was a time when it didn't seem right to have a wild-eyed preacher prophesying about the coming destruction and decimation of a people when they already had a so-called king, they already had a so-called revival, a quasi-reformation under Josiah, but they were still wicked and God knew it. I wish somebody would help me. And in America, we have spots and sprinkles of movements and good services and good times. And everybody throws their hands up in the air and say, oh, God has remembered America and that God is watching over America. And God's going to do this and God is going to do that when he is absolutely doing the opposite of what those preachers tell you. You're just looking at me like deer standing at headlights. Honey, all no, that's the problem with us is because we believe those Sunday day preachers while it's raining outside and we walk outside saying it ain't going to rain, it ain't going to rain, and your head is wet. Come on now. Now, I don't believe in the mentality that the sky is falling, but I am a realist and I recognize and realize if I walk outside and I feel water, I, I know it's raining. I got a little bit of a brain left since the 80s. Is anybody with me? What you looking at me and laughing? You know it's the truth. Some of y'all 60s anyways. Back in that day. Check this out. So it was a time of reformation. It was a time of false revival. Watch what he does. Verse 3. And they say unto them, and say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed. Be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Now, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Who said this? God said it through his prophet Jeremiah. You're, they're in the midst of revival. Listen to me now. They're in the midst of something happening, some movement, if you will, a false type of reformation, and God says you're cursed. See, in America, we say we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed. God says, no, you're not, you're cursed. Our preachers get up and say, man, you're awesome. You're wonderful. God says, no, you got sin. We need to talk about it. Come on now. Well, I've given. I've done this. I'm faithful. I'm to this. God says, no, you're wretched. You're miserable, poor, and naked. See, we don't want to hear that. If you truly love God, you don't mind being told the truth. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for caring about me when I fall, when I mess up and I'm dirty to help me get clean so I can live right, talk right, and be right and be holy in your sight. Thank you, God, you care enough for me to, to, to correct me. Come on. It's a stubborn mule that can't be corrected. Don't look at your neighbor, but it's a stubborn mule. I said, you need to be corrected. I need to be corrected on a daily basis. If I need it, give it to me, Jesus. Help me, because I would rather fall into the hands of a loving God than to fall in the hands of my enemy. That's what David said. David had a choice. You can either be chastened by your enemies or you can fall into the hands of God. He said, I'd rather fall in the hands of God because he's merciful. Come on, somebody. His mercies are renewed every single day. Verse 3, thou say unto him, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, cursed be that a man that obeyeth not the, re- the words of this covenant. Can I explain to you what the word cursed means there? Because in our American mindset, we think it's a witch with a crooked nose and a ward on top. Saying all kinds of bibble babble baloney. No, cursed there means to be naked. Naked and uncovered. In other words, when you walk in sin, you walk away from the covenant of God, and therefore you're naked from the blessings and the protection of God. And a nation, just like a people, can do the same. And I promise you, and I declare to you today, and the evidence is there, that our nation is naked before God. We're not in covenant with him. We call good evil and evil good. We compare political people, entities, flesh, rotten, stinking flesh to Christ himself. Political persecution to compare to crucifixion. It's blasphemic. It's absolutely for the pit of hell. But it's in the house of God. And God says you're cursed. You're cursed because you put a man above me. You're cursed because you put a national anthem above me. You're cursed because you put a flag above me. You're cursed because you put all these things above me. Cursed. Again, in the understanding that they're in revival. There are plastic bananas walking around thinking everything's cool and kosher and calm and collective and wonderful. God is with us. And God sends a prophet to shake it up. I love it, don't you? I love when God brings a prophet into the house and brings a prophetic word into a nation and just shakes everybody up and says, no, let me tell you what God says. Because the prophetic will always be in opposition to what trend is. You better believe that. The prophetic will always be in opposition to Jezebel. Come on now. The prophetic will always shake you off your chair. And shake you out of complacency and wake you from your coma. Always. And so he said, you're naked, you're uncovered. Who? The one that doesn't obey the covenant. Which I commanded you, verse 4, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Do you know the covenant still stands today? From the iron furnace What is the iron furnace? The bondage of sin. I took you out of Egypt. I took you out of bondage. Saying, watch this, obey my voice and do them. That's pretty good, don't you think? According to all which I commanded, so shall you be my people and I will be your God. You ought to underline that. So how do you become the people of God? Not by birth. You may be born an American because your mom and daddy are American, but you ain't born a Christian. You got to be born again. To be born again is by the spirit and by the word. In other words, there's a new creation and a new life and new evidence that verifies and confirms that you are born again. If you talk and walk and think and act like you used to, you ain't born again. You just gone to a good church service, cried a little bit at the altar, and you just wanted to be so-called a church member. But a Christian is a disciple, which is what? A disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. And we don't have many of them in the house of God. We got pew warmers. We got church folk that sit and bobble their head like this and say, yeah, amen. 
instead of doing and obey. Watch this. They thought they were doing obey and obey because the priests were saying we're in reformation. The king says we're in reformation. The denomination says we're in uh, reformation and revival. Everybody's talking about it. But the prophet walked in and said, uh-uh, excuse me. God said, you're wretched. You're naked. You're uncovered. You're out of the covenant. You are doing what God told the forefathers not to do. Sound familiar? Obey my voice, and guess what? You'll be my people and my God. And I'll be your God. So how do we get... How do we get to that place? Well, you got to make God your God. You got to obey him and listen to his voice. Well, that ain't happening in America. Oh, no, no. That's not happening in America. We're not obeying the voice of God. We don't even know who he is. The church don't even know who he is. Preachers don't know who he is. They know it in concept and a little bit of precept, but they don't understand truth because they don't spend no time with God. Oh, I'm feeling good this morning. What a beautiful day it is today. Obey my voice and and do them according to all, 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 which I command you. No, no, no. We're going to do what we want to do, Jesus. We're just going to cut out some things. So shall you be my people and I will be your God. Here's the thing about it. America thinks they get a pass because of our Christian history. You don't get a pass. The sins of the fathers come back to the sons without repentance. It's called a generational curse. Man, I feel good today. I'll throw this jacket off. It's a generational curse. It continues from one generation to another until somebody stands up and says, no, not in my home. No, not in my family. I rebuke that. I curse that. It's not going to be a part of the history of my family. But if you don't do that, then the sins of the father come back on to the sons. And we're watching that happen in our nation today because we have made no national repentance. We haven't even repented for what we've done to the Indians. Somebody help me. And money is not a repentance. Grant and land given back to them that was stolen, is it? Someone help me today, is not repentance. We need to go to an almighty God and say, God, forgive us for so many atrocities of our lives. But no, we don't want to hear that because we don't believe that history. But America doesn't get a pass. No nation gets a pass because of their history. Verse 5, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Notice this. He said, I want to bless you. Listen to me. God wants to bless America. God wants to bless people. God wants to bless the house of God. He wants to bless folks. You better believe that. That's his first choice. But he don't bless mess. He don't abide in sin, not in habitation. He'll visit sin in order for the sinner to get saved. He ain't afraid of sin. He's not ashamed of sin. He sees it, knows it, and he's there in the midst of it. Is anybody here? He's right now with that prostitute. He's there with that drug addict. He's there. He's in that shooting gallery, if you will, that trailer park where they're shooting up and doing meth. And he's there. He's an ever-present help. He never leaves. He's not afraid of the devil. Come on, help me, somebody. If there's air, there's the Holy Ghost. Woo, glory to God, he's there. That's why you can call back your way with children. That's why you can call upon the name of the Lord and bam, he's there. Woo, glory. You don't have to show up and say, wait a minute, I, I don't know if I can go in that crack house or not. Don't know if I can go in that jail cell. I, I, I can do a work release program, but that maximum security, there's killers there. I'm not going. Come on, I'm about to run around this building. I'm glad he's there. He lands where the flies won't. Bam, I wish I had somebody help me today. So glad he came to where I was. You may not want to visit me in my stank, but God did. I said God did, and he visited you too. So he's an ever-present help. He's not afraid of the devil. He's not afraid of the darkness because darkness can't comprehend his light. Hallelujah. There is no darkness when he shows up. 
Not even a shadow of turning, no variableness in our God. I wish somebody helped me preach this thing today. Watch this, watch this. He, 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 he says, look, I, 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 I want to show you my blessings. I want to provide for you. I've given you this land even this day. Watch what he's saying. Even in the midst of persecution, destruction, calamity, cry, whatever the case is, I am still there providing for you that land of milk and honey. I got good news for a believer. You can be living in the land of milk and honey while famine is all around you. Oh, I, listen to me now. You can be blessed in the midst of all the mess. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But you just got to learn how to recognize blessing. Somebody help me. Blessing isn't a whole loaf of bread. Blessing can be a piece of bread. It don't have to be wheat bread, organic bread, gluten-free bread. It could be bread. When you're hungry, bread's bread. See, we have this mentality, it's got to be the best, it's got to be all this, it's got to be... Listen, I believe God created great value. And white box macaroni. Is anybody here today? Woo! Glory to God. Don't even know the name of it. Don't need no ingredients. Just eat and shut up. Let me all know what I'm talking about. What are the instructions? I don't know. Cook. Hurry up and eat it. But in our mentality, we, you know, it's got to be this. It's got to be Gucci. It's got to be this. All these things entraps us. Your blessings are bigger than you know. They're more than you know. Just go overseas, man. Just go see people that are living on a shoestring. But that shoestring's better than those that are living on nothing. It's your perspective. So he said, I want to bless you. I want to bless you as it is this day. Then answered I and said, Lord, so be it. Look at that. So be it, Lord. What is Jeremiah doing? He's agreeing with God. Jeremiah is not a prophet of doom and gloom. I, I want to break these glasses because we always take these prophets and we say, oh, they're bad, bad, bad. Here they come with the cane and the long beard and the fiery eyes. and Not so. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet for a reason. He cared. There's a reason why we have an outreach, disaster relief. There's a reason why we're building widows' homes. There's a reason why we're trying to reach everybody, because we care. But we got a message of warning. It's a time of the process of decimation. If you don't believe that, you haven't read the book of Revelation. It is a process of depopulation. Why? Because of judgment. I can't cut it any other way. I can't make it Americanized. I can't make it fancy. It is what it is. I mean, you drink castor oil, you can't do anything with it. You could throw peppermint in it, it still tastes terrible. Come on now. You ever go to the doctor and give you certain medicine? I'd go, I'd say, why don't you make that like bubble gum? You go to the dentist and they give you this stuff, you feel sicker than when you went. I said, how about Bubblicious or Hubba Bubba or Trident or something? They, they, this, you know, you, you feel worse. But watch what he says here. Then the Lord said unto me, okay, Jeremiah, I appreciate you being compassionate. Now, okay, that's great. Nice tears. Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. Somebody say everywhere. Saying, hear the words of this covenant and do them. I want you to notice, notice this. God is very serious about you doing some things. Verse 4, he said, do them. Verse 6, he said, do them. Then don't just sit there in church and do the bobblehead. Go do them. Go do what? The words of the covenant. Go do what God told you to do. If you're a Christian, be a Christian. Witness your faith. Well, I'm not very good at witnessing. I got a box full of tracks back there. Go get you some tracks. Stick it in the beer bottles. I did this weekend. Yes, I did. I can't wait. That guy goes to get that lager. Yeah, we're going to belt down a couple of beer. Eternal life, wasn't it? <laughs> and maybe it'll be a backslidden preacher's son that reads that and says, Oh, my God, I got to get saved. You don't know. You don't know. Sow the seed and find out. You ever gone fishing before? You don't know. Keep casting it in. 
get you another jig. Do something else. Get another reel. Get another uh, another line test. Do something. No, I just, I'm just waiting for it all to crash, Pastor. Well, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. That wasn't nice. I know. What else you want me to say, dumb dumb? I mean, this is wrong. That's not a Christian. A Christian goes out and does what? What Christians do? Instead of just hanging out, and, I don't know, I want everything to fall apart and have glee about it. Jeremiah was in tears for this nation. Jeremiah was sorrowful because he knew it was happening. But God said, listen, I want you to do this, son. I want you to proclaim this thing everywhere. Tell them to do this. Verse 7. Watch what God is saying. And this, this is my whole thing. This, is, this fits exactly my philosophy, my whole attribute, my whole attitude, the whole characteristic that makes me up as a preacher. This is exactly the way I feel because God is this way right here. He said, watch what he says. Verse 7. Are you there? Get your glasses on so you can read it good. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers. I earnestly. What do you, you know what that means? It means he warned them. He did not just wake up and say, okay, you're crispy critters. You're done. You're finished. Whoop. No, he didn't do that. No, he said, I protested. That's funny. We get up, we protest everything in America. And we don't think God protests. God protests in heaven saying, no, 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 don't do that. I don't want you to do that. I want you to turn lest you burn. Come on, preachers, I need you to protest for me. Speak for me in your pulpits. Hold up that sign, which is the word of God, and cry out to the people, repent, repent, repent. No, we don't do that. We're worried about saving the spotted well or transgenderism or any other type of ism that's out there. And we're willing to lay down our lives for a political, I'm just being nice now. It's insanity. And God says, I protest unto my people. I protest unto your fathers. I begged them. I warned them. I sent them prophets. And I said, I'm coming. I'm going to bring destruction to your country. I'm going to bring judgment to your nation. I'm going to bring decimation to you. And we refuse to listen. Oh, that's just that nutty guy over at 580 East Main Street. That's just that crazy dude. That's just that crazy dudette, whoever she is or whoever he is on television, that's preaching and prophesying truth. Oh, that's just that little old man in the storefront preaching in a monotone type of voice in a radio AM frequency. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? That's usually where you find those dudes. Got that little squeaky voice. I'm telling you, the Lord's coming to judge. Don't want to hear it, man. No, this is America, bro. You, you, you're messing everything up, bro. You're messing everything up. You're messing up my, my vibes. Well, God's going to shake your vibes. I say he's going to shake your vibes. He's doing it for a reason because he loves you. He loves the sinner. Like I said before, he's in that ballroom right now. He ain't afraid of that. He ain't afraid of honky-tonk. We got a misnomer about God. We got got an illusion about God. We don't understand him. That's why we don't reach to people like we're supposed to. Well, I don't go there because I'm too holy. No, you're holy. For I earnestly protest, I warned your fathers in that day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even until this day, rising early and protesting. He said it twice. Let me tell you something. When God does something, says something twice, he means it. I don't know about you. When my daddy spoke to me, he had one tone of voice, and that was you better do it. The second gear was the gear you don't want to hear because that gear came with stuff. All I had to hear was Benjamin. Next was whack. Oh, no. well, that's abuse. No, that was honor. <laughs> that was listening to when I heard that word, Benjamin. I knew that if I didn't obey on that particular call, the next one was lights out or something going to happen 
or a whooping. But no, we don't care. We're, yeah, God, whatever. Yeah, whatever, God. My pastor said, I can boogie-woogie all night long. I can do what I want to do. I can do this. I can go down the crystal slipper. I can hang out. I can do everything I want to do. I can love who I want to love. I can love the way I want to love. I mean, I can just do it. My preacher said, so God, don't worry about it. That's the truth. It's the truth if you sit in most Sunday services, preachers just say, well, live the way you want to do instead of putting the foot where it belongs. Listen, baby, it's all in love. I ain't getting no love back on that one. Isn't it? It's all in love. But it's all we ever hear. No, you don't. You hear truth. You hear truth. And that truth transforms you if you let it. It builds a culture of understanding of God. And that's what we've lost. We don't have a culture of understanding about God. We've designed culture away from God and do what we want to do and say, God, fit into this and bless our culture. God says, I don't do that. I don't do very good at conforming. You conform to me. I earnestly protested. I warned your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Watch this. He said, I warned them, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, obey my voice. It's that easy. You know, after a couple whacks by a belt, I got what daddy meant. A couple of the hairs being pulled by the nap of my neck, which was connected to the spinal cord, I believe. I don't have medical proof, but I think there's something about the hair on your neck, the spinal cord, and going like this up and down saying yes is connected. (laughs) And it may even move your feet robotically. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Because that's all mama could ever grab because I thought I was fast enough until she got a hold of the nap of the neck. (laughs) Daddy was way faster. He used to be a street fighter, so I couldn't get away from pops. Uh, is anybody here? And all of a sudden, as soon as she pulled that little hair, you just started to obey. Okay, okay. Even at 16 with long hair, thinking I was this and that and knew it all, but it still brought me to my knees. Anybody here? <laughs> you old hippie. But see, that's what God wants to do. He wants you at Benjamin. He wants you at the very call to obey. He does not want to go the route of punishment, but he will. I protested, rising early. He sent his prophets, watch, obey my voice. Verse 8, yet you obeyed not, nor inclined their ear. They didn't obey. They didn't incline their ear, but walked after everyone and their imagination of their evil heart. Do you know what the word imagination is the translation in Hebrew. You you know, if you read King James, okay, it's a great translation, but there's so many things that are left out that if you look in the Hebrew and the Greek, you really get a better understanding. The imagination means lust, but it also means twisted. It's a firm twisting of what you believe, what you desire. In other words, if I want something in my life, in my flesh, and I want God to conform to it, watch this, I'll find scriptures and a preacher who will help me twist what I'm wanting for the lust of my flesh, and it becomes the foundation that I believe. That's called deception. That's called going to a cultic church and cultic Christianity in America. You found some puppet to stand before you and twist it in order to fulfill your lust. I ain't twisting nothing, baby. I never even like twisted sisters. Anybody here? I'm not going to twist anything for you. You are the one that's twisted. My job as a pastor is to untwist you. That's why people don't like hearing these words because they got to get uncontorted. Don't know if that's good English or not, but it sounds good to me. Uncontorted. Is anybody here straighten your little thing out? Watch this. Sarah, don't get me in trouble now. 
Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but they walked everyone in their imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, watch this, therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I have commanded them to do, but they did them not. Now, I do not have the time. I want to quote the whole thing. But you need to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 talks about what? The blessings of God if you obey, the cursings of God if you disobey. He's telling them through Jeremiah the prophet, remember what I said to your fathers, I will bless you if you obey, but if you don't obey, I will curse you. Now today in New Testament, under grace and the blood of Jesus, we think that this doesn't matter and God has forgotten that part of how he used to be. He's no longer meanie pants. Can I explain to you? He is God Almighty and always will be God. He didn't get saved at Calvary. You did. What he's done is he's offered grace and he extended an opportunity into his kingdom through Christ the king. You still have to enter in through the blood. No man comes to the father but who? Through the son. So there's still the gateway of redemption which is through Christ to say his cross and his body and his blood. But if you don't cross that line, if you don't carry that cross, if you're not born again, then you are alienated from God and the covenants thereof, and you are damned. That's what the Bible teaches. Can I have somebody that would agree with the Bible today? And therefore, if we find ourselves on the wrong side of the cross, we find ourselves on the wrong side of God, then there's only one answer to that, and that is judgment. But on the good side, if I follow Christ and his truth and follow the commandments of God, then I will live in the land of milk and honey. I will live on the Deuteronomy 28 side of blessing. Now, this ain't hard for me. Going back to daddy and the belt, I understand if I listen to daddy, I get good stuff. I get to ride in the front seat of the station wagon, the front, the front car of the car. Is anybody here? Get to hang out with dad. But if I don't, I'm in the back of the station wagon without a seatbelt. Some of y'all can't go back that far. You remember them days riding in the back of a, of a station wagon? We had no seatbelt. We made a mat back there, and we slap or play with our, our lions and tigers and cars and dolls and dogs. Man, the station wagon. We need them back again, don't we? Things were awesome, man. My dad had a Dodge, man. It was wonderful. I hated it growing up, but now I look back and say, man, that thing looked like a hearse. It was awesome. <laughs> My horse was green. First, everything was green. In fact, the whole kitchen was green. <laughs> Welcome to my avocado. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about. Now it's coming back. You know, I'll tell you this real quick. In my man cave over in my barn, I put in, I found a, a pink toilet. Was it pink? It was pink. A pink toilet. I don't know where I was. It was some yard sale, and I picked up a pink toilet. I thought that was the coolest thing to have a pink toilet. Well, a plumber came by and helped me do some work, and he said, you know how expensive them pink toilets are today? I said, no, I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't know. They're worth a lot of money. So I do have a throne I'm not getting rid of, man. The thing was awesome. Come on now, retro. Ain't nothing wrong with retro. Don't throw away some of your old stuff. Hold on to it. Man, if you got an 8-track, you are like in, man. You are in. Watch this. I'm lighting you up for a reason. And the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy. You want a conspiracy, YouTube? Here it is, right here. God's got a conspiracy. You know what that means? It means a treason, an unlawful alliance. There is treason happening in the house of God. There's treason in America. There's an unlawful alliance. What is an alliance? Alliance is a connection, a combination, a joining together that which is not of God, that which is not holy. No different than nationalistic, patriotic, all the stuff that we have going on, mingling it with the cross and the flag and all this stuff that rises above truth, that is an abomination. That is wrong. Loving country, loving all the, the things that you have, that's secondary. 
Loving Christ, the King, and following truth, that's primary, number one. He said it's treason. It's found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Sounds like America. They are turned back to the iniquities of their fathers, which refuse to hear my words. So in other words, you're repeating what your fathers did. Are we doing it? Yes. Watch this. Which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them. I will do what? Bring evil upon them. Why is it happening? Why is this happening in America? I'm bringing evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. The evil that's happening in our world today is not going to be escaped. You can isolate yourself and insulate yourself by the blood of the Lamb and being part of the covenant of God, but you can't escape it. And that's the problem with the church in America. We have an escapism mentality that's selling big bucks, man, doing real good. Whether it's rapture out of here or putting an entity in the White House to help us protect us, that's a pipe dream. Curse is a man who puts his trust in flesh. Curse is a man who puts his trust in horses and chariots. We put our trust in the name of the Lord. Don't be confused, America. Don't be confused. What's happening is supposed to happen. Verse 10. And they turned back to the iniquities of their fathers. They refused to uh, hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah, which I've broken my covenant, which I've made with their fathers. Verse 11. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I'll bring evil upon them. I want you to hear it again. Which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then the cities... Then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It amazes me that when a national cat catastrophic event takes place, people start praying. That ain't how it works. Oh, the NFL's praying. Man, that guy got hurt. Look at them all get together. It was all over YouTube. Wow, they're unifying. They're really praying. Oh, the same heathens, the same pagans that cursed the name of God to play before are now getting together asking for a merciful God to have mercy on a situation. That's hypocritical. I'm just telling them, people don't like me, I don't really care. The sisters say, oh, God, have mercy on us. No, why didn't, you, why didn't you call a solemn assembly before the storm came? Why didn't you cry out to God before it happened? Why are you joining hands now, singing Kumbaya and praying over it? Don't get me wrong. I understand the relief and, and crying out to God. I'm talking about the hypocrite now. I'm talking about the sinner. I'm talking about the person that all of a sudden goes to an almighty God after the fact. Why don't you try before the fact, and there may not be an after fact. I get it, it rains on the just and the unjust. I'm not going through the whole theology here. But I'm just telling you, it's hypocritical in our nation. Let's all pray and have a moment of silence. No, let's shout unto God now. Let's cry out to God now. Say, God, have mercy before it comes. We recognize and realize what we're doing. No, we don't do that. That's proactive. I don't feel like I'm all by myself up here, but I'm having a good time. I know how to have a, I can have a good time by myself. I know how. I've been preaching a long time. I've been talking to that mirror for a long time. I can do it. Come on now. It's the absolute truth. We want God to bless something after the fact. Instead of saying, God, we're wretched now. Protect us and provide for us. I plead the blood of Jesus over my home. I plead the blood of Jesus from, from county line to county line. Bless my region. Bless my area. Let no storm come upon us, oh God. Keep us from the evil one. Keep pornography out of our places. Keep uh, uh, bars and lounges and craziness out of our place, God. Do it. Come on. And even when the devil's already been in there, curse it. Curse the package stores. Huh? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Say, so Lord, get that blight out of here. Make my city 
appeal. Make my leaders, my mayor, my council, uh, council, make those people, the commissioners, make those uh, be accountable to you, God. Instead of falling for money, big people walking in and pushing little people around because of money. God save us. Well, that's a pipe dream. No, it's not. You can have a Goshen moment anywhere. God can, can set up a Goshen property anywhere he wants to. You want ocean property? God says, I'll give you Goshen property. Right. Say, what is Goshen property? That's a place of protection. Yes. I didn't say a place of perfection, a place of protection. Yes. Protect me, Father, in the midst of a cr- perverse and crooked terminal generation. I'm about to run around this building. We don't do that. No, no, no. We don't. Oh, it happens. And then we cry and we grab the flag and we grab our Bible. We say, oh, God, help us. I am not making fun of anybody. I'm just telling you the reactive, hypocritical attitude of a backslidden, paganized, Christian, so-called nation. Junk. Absolute tripe. I don't shed a tear. I look at it and I see the destruction. And I'm very sorrowful. I'll do everything I possibly can to help. But when I see people praying that never prayed, come on, somebody, since, since Sunday school, that's the wrong time to pray. Unless you're praying repentance, unless you're crying out to God, those prayers are going on ears that don't hear it. In other words, God's not listening to it. Watch this. I got to go because you're getting mad, and it's making me want to preach more. Watch this. Where in the world am I? I'm in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> Where was I at? I was at verse, uh, verse 12. Watch this. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods and to whom they offer incense. See, watch this. They go right back. They go right back. Go right back. Dog to the vomit. Swine to the mud. But they shall not serve them at all in the time of their trouble. In other words, these false gods ain't going to help you. So we go to the false gods of FEMA. We go to the false gods of the government. We go to the false gods of this. We go to the false gods of that. And they don't help us. According, watch this, for according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O inhabitants, o, o, o Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Now, what that means about the, the streets, it means this. This is exactly what it means. It means the whole nation. He was using it prof- uh, poetically of a prophetic truth. Truth, Everywhere, everywhere in the nation, it's just altars, altars, altars unto who? Bell. When you put your trust in anything, any person, any government, any individual outside of God, you are serving Bell. I said your full trust. You can have partial confidence. You can have partial leaning towards. There's nothing wrong with that. I expect State Farm to take care of me should I need them. Somebody have a brain say amen. I expect I paid money into it. I'm going to get some type of return. I expect that. But I don't expect State Farm to keep me from a semi. That semi says, it's not going to say, oh, I can't hit him. He's got a safe far. Oh, my gosh. I can hit that guy. He's got Geico. (laughs) I'm going to go for the lower guy. (laughs) Right? Where's all the Kias? I'm going to run them all over. I'm not touching that Oldsmobile. That thing there, that's going to hurt me. Come on now. Now, That's what we think. Well, I got a church. You know, my pastor's so and so. I'm protected. No, you better you better know God. Don't shake my hand thinking you're gonna make it to heaven through me. You ain't making it nowhere through me. Believe me, I know my limitations. I am very clear with the Father before I ever stand up any time to minister to anybody. I can't do it. I, I do. I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do it. I can't lead anybody spiritually. Nobody wants to listen to me. Without the anointing and the unction, you're nobody too. Well, preachers need to get a hold of that. They need, they need to allow God to wear them like a glove, and you wear God like a coat. Whoo! Glory to God Almighty. We need some pastors like that again. Watch this. I got about another hour, and I'm trying to bring it in to about 10 minutes. Watch this. The whole nation, verse 14, therefore pray not for these people. There it is. Don't pray for these people. What are you going to pray for after the fact? 
Neither lift up a cry of prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time of their cry and unto me for their trouble. See, we don't, we don't believe God that, is that way. He is that way. He's talking about hypocritical people now. Listen to me. I'm not talking about the destitute and somebody that just cries out and says, God, I need you. He's a never-present help. He will always be there. You better believe that. If you, if you hear me wrong, that's your fault. You need some new hearing aids. They sell them over the counter now, I think. Super lithium batteries. You can hear your neighbor. Come on, somebody. Hear the word of the Lord. I'm telling you the very characteristic of God is to save that which is lost. But he's against the proud. He's against the pagan, heathen, that refuses to obey. You better believe it. He is. And that's the problem we have in America is we don't preach this anymore. What hath my beloved to do in mine house? Here it is, verse 15. I'm hitting it. What hath my beloved to do in my house? Can I, can I give you the translation of what it should be? What right do you have to be in my house? I, I should have started this an hour ago. What right do you have to be in his house? Think about it for a minute. What right does anybody, including myself, have to, have, have to be in this kingdom? What right do I have? I'm going to tell you what right you have if the blood of Jesus has made you clean. If you've been forgiven, you've got the right to be in this house. His kingdom. You don't have the right to be in there because you're an American. Or you were born to Christian parents. Or your papa was a preacher. Or a pew maker. No, you must come through the blood. And when you go through the blood, then you're born again. Then you have the right to be in my house. So he's rebuking them. Remember, take this into consideration. They have a false reformation. Josiah is king, quasi-revival, superficial at best, and they're still worshiping Baal. Hypocritical, just like this nation. You're hypocrites, America. I'm not afraid to tell you. Oh, there's so many good things. about. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. But we ain't talking about that today. We're talking about how God views a hypocritical nation that says they love him, has steeples and people and crosses and all these different things, but yet they live for a bell as soon as the bell rings and they leave the house of God. You're still a child of the devil. Well, that's offensive. It only offends you if it fits you. If it doesn't fit you, it shouldn't offend you. You just look at your neighbor and say, see, I told you he was talking about you today. Or someone say, how do you know you're talking about my parents and my family? Watch this. What right do you have to be in my house, seeing that she hath wrought lewdness with many? In other words, encounters that were wrong, intimate encounters. And the holy flesh sacrifice, which is what it means, is passed from thee. Can I tell you what that means? The translation again, King James, it just does not have what it means. It means this. I'm going to read it to you. Ready? When sacrifices are offered in hypocrisy, they cannot, they cannot avert disaster. They guarantee it. That's exactly the meaning in the Hebrew. That's exactly how it should be, should be warded. What, word, why, what right do you have to be in my house? Those sacrifices that you're giving to me, come on, on Sunday morning, while you go out and worship Baal after you leave, that's hypocritical, and it will not avert my disasters and my judgment. Decimation. I don't care how much in God you trust you got on your dollar bills and your T-shirts and on the back of your bumper stickers and the back of your tags and all this stuff. America, God bless America, God bless America. God's like, who? You don't have a right to be in my house and your little bit of tripe sacrificial campaign slogans don't mean nothing to me. Here comes judgment. I hate that guy. I don't want you to hate me. I want you to love the word. I want you to love God. I want you to reason with God, reason what's happening in our country. Yes, the United States definitely is the earth's punching bag. And it's only going to be worse. Why? Because we claim to be God's people. 
and we have fallen away from him and we're backslidden. And God says, I'm going to deal with you. Watch this. I have three minutes left on the Mickey Mouse clock in front of me. She's she's wrought this lewdness. Watch this. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. In other words, we sit there and we applause the transgenderism, braveness. Coming out of the closet for homosexuality, lesbianism, the sodomites. The church parades and say how how powerful and how courageous and how bold to stand out. I'm not talking about hurting anybody. I'm talking about calling sin, sin. If you don't like those words, then they're sodomites. How's that? Or a pornographer or a fornicator or a pedophilia. Whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. How about just sin? Evil. But we just sit there and we applaud and say, wow, wow. We accept it, and God says it's putrid to me. Watch this. I, I'm, I'm trying to find a place to close, but I really don't feel like closing. I feel like opening this thing larger. You rejoice in it. Verse 16, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. That's what he called you. With the noise of a great torment hath he kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. That's America today. We're broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee has pronounced evil against thee. Can I tell you something? The same God that planted is the same God that can uproot. He is the master gardener. For the Lord of hosts has done this. For the evil, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves. Notice this, and I am closing. They've done what? They brought evil against themselves to provoke me to anger. God didn't do this. God didn't wake up and say, I'm mad at everybody. God didn't wake up and say, I hate you. God didn't say, I hate America. I hate the sodomites. He didn't wake up and say, I hate all this sin. The sinner. He hates the sin, of course. But he didn't wake up saying, I'm going to destroy everybody. It says he earnestly protested. I'm telling you, stop it. Stop messing with our little children in school. Messing up their minds. Stop making them Frankenstein ex- medical experiments. Stop messing with my creation and my divine order. I'm telling you, I'm going to put more pain on you than you can imagine. Listen, that isn't my desire. I am far from wanting to see this. I'm just telling you what's fixing to happen to America because of our sin and the world. Verse 18, and the Lord hath given me knowledge of it. I have to close there. What does that mean that the Lord God has given me knowledge of it? Watch this. God said to Jeremiah, I've given you knowledge and revelation. In other words, they thought they were skating, dancing, partying, and parading in this new revival. But God told a prophet underneath all of it was sin, that it wasn't right, it wasn't real. And Jeremiah said, I knew it. How did he know it? through revelation from God because the character of Jeremiah was to weep but God had to straighten him out and say no you're going to prophesy the characteristics of Jeremiah was to intercede God said no you're not going to pray do you understand that God was showing his mercy through Jeremiah but God was also highly protesting the sin that was being fabricated it was being lied and hit hidden by hypocrisy through a false revival Later on, it says that the man of Anathoth, which was his hometown, sought to kill him. Listen, the people closest to you will always try to destroy the prophetic reality of truth. They'll always try to stop the prophetic voice, but it will not happen. God will have his prophets. God will have his watchmen, and he will warn the nations of the world. If you're watching me right now, you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. These are heavy words for sure, but I assure you, God loves you. He hates to sin. But he loves you, and he wants you to come out from where you are in that sin, in that degradation, and come to the salvation and redemptive knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that easy. Repent of your sins. He says he'll wash you clean and give you a name that is written in heaven. If you're backslidden, these things apply to you. Get straight today. Get right with God. Be untwisted, if you will, of false doctrines that are keeping you from a great relationship with God. Heavenly Father, thank you. Help us to understand during this process of decimation 
that you are the source of all life and you are our protection. And we trust you in Jesus' name.